So our next story is uh, we're going to talk about natural gas. City of Eugene, the city council in a five to three vote voted to ban natural gas and new construction. Um, it's a, uh, it's, it, it, and it's not going over well. Um, the, the community is kind of waking up and uh, they're in an uproar over it. And uh, we talked with uh, Randy Groves, who is the council president, um, about that. And a bunch of other stuff came up in the conversation. So this segment of our show is sponsored by Chris Dental Family Dentistry. What is it about dentistry that just connected for you? Because, I mean, it's, it's quite a jump from journalism <laughs> to, de- to yeah. being a doctor. I'm not the most social person in the world, like, like not like you, um, but I do like interaction with people. Uh, and it's fun people being people's doctors. And I feel like I am a caring person, so I like figuring stuff out. I can figure it out. I can diagnose a tooth almost better than anybody. I've had people come in, they've been to three other dentists, they can't figure out what's going on. And I can, I, I like that. It's like, a, like being a, a detective. And you've also really centered your practice on buying American with your crowns and that kind of, I mean, that's, oh, yeah. that's really important to you. Yeah. If I could, I, if I could buy everything hundred percent American, I would, it's hard. Like I even told my reps, I've, I've repeated my reps several times. Like I don't want to buy stuff from China. I, I want to try to buy stuff in the United States. So my, my crowns are American. Uh, I even talked to the, the lab into making sure they buy all the products from America. Like we need. Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. And uh, today on this segment of Get Real with Rick Dancer, this whole show is focusing on energy. So now we're going to go to natural gas. And um, a lot of folks in Montana have been asking me the question, and all my friends in Oregon always ask the question, um, is it true that the city of Eugene is banning uh, natural gas use in some new commercial construction? And yes, that is true. That's what's on the docket. And to, to help us better understand what's going on and talk about this whole topic, uh, bring on Randy Groves, a Eugene city councilor. Mm-hmm. And also, we could, we could go back to your past because that's where our past really match, where he was also uh, a chief of the fire department. And uh, you've been involved in civics for a long time. Many, many years, over 40 years. Wow. So, Randy, tell me, what exactly does this move do so that my, my viewers and stuff, I kind of understand where we're starting from? Certainly, Rick. Uh, the, the vote that passed uh, in a 5-3 vote of city council on February 6th was to ban uh, natural gas hookups and infrastructure in new low rise residential buildings. But what's important to understand about this, this is one of three um, elements being considered. Phase one was low rise uh, residential construction. Phase two, uh, we'll be talking about um, banning hookups in new commercial and industrial applications. In phase three will be a discussion about decarbonization of existing buildings. So and why here, and maybe, I don't know if you can explain this or not, but what is their fear over natural gas? The concern is, uh, the perspective is it's, it's creating uh, greenhouse gas emissions and part of our carbon footprint that, um, the people that are pushing this want to see eliminated. And I think we all care about our environment. Right. We all care about our climate. Um, there's a number of things we can be doing, in my opinion, that would make a bigger impact and uh, create less of a divisive posture between our, our members of our community. So what are some other things you think we should be looking at, Randy, or that you mean th- Sure. I think we should be looking at uh, weatherization programs in pre-1995 buildings because the building standards changed significantly in 1995. That's when we went to the six-inch uh, st- exterior stud walls, uh, increased insulation both above and below uh, a structure. And I think we should be doing that for uh, regardless of energy type, uh, but targeting those pre-1995 buildings, which would also uh, give some incentives to landlords and property owners that are, that are renting their, their, their property, which would also have the effect of helping some of our, our lowest wage earners in our community. Right, That's, that would help low income people. How is banning natural gas uh, in, in new construction 
because right now you guys are so far behind on construction housing for uh, decades behind on providing, uh, you know, any kind of housing, let alone affordable housing. And how does this, if the, if the council's goal is one of their goals has always been to, to deal with the, it's the biggest problem in Oregon, I think is affordable housing, one of them. And yes. how is, how is banning an energy source going to improve that? I don't think it is going to improve it. The argument I hear is uh, renters have no choice of their energy type. They, they basically end up with whatever uh, the landlord is using to energize the, uh, or heat uh, the uh, um, rental that they, they reside in. And so the, the concern from the advocates that I've heard is people don't have a, a choice on what they consider a health hazard. So is there that you've looked into, is there any legitimacy to their concerns? I've read studies, quite frankly, that shake out on both sides of the issue. But, uh, you know, it, it, any cooking, for example, and it, a lot of it ends up around um, indoor cooking. Right. And yes, any so. cooking, regardless of the energy type, should be properly ventilated because, you know, there's off-gassing uh, from the cooking process that emits particulate matter and, and other contaminants that really aren't good for us to breathe. But that applies regardless of the energy type. Well, but what I find interesting about this whole movement to ban energy sources is, you know, talk to people over in third world countries where they're cooking in, a, in their houses, uh, dying of lung cancer because they don't have any kind of, they, they can't worry about the environment. They're too busy trying to stay warm with fire and, you know, c cooking their stoves. And, and, and then we come up here and we start doing stuff like this. It, it, it's also interesting to me that, that we, you, you guys also are in a nuclear free zone in your county, which nuclear energy is the cleanest. And according to research that I've seen, um, one of the safest things that you can do if you look at everything that's been done, the accidents and electrical plants and all that kind of stuff, it's really fairly safe. And it is the very cleanest form of energy you can get. And yet you live in a county that, that bans it and, and also now doesn't want to have natural gas. What happens when you rip out the dams? They don't like hydroelectric either because your dams are plugging the rivers. It's like, what do you do? You can't, you, you need energy. Well, and that, that is a real concern with the loss of hydroelectric generation. We are looking right now, um, the federal government, at, uh, eliminating the four dams in the lower Snake River Canyon. All of them are hydro projects. In addition, there are four projects under consideration for elimination, dam removal, in the uh, Klamath River Basin. So you're, you're correct. Every time we lose one of these projects and I want to protect the fish as well, but you know, every time we lose one of these, there's an effect on uh, supply. And if we don't have enough supply, all of a sudden, just take a look at California, what's going yeah. on down there. And they're having <laughs> routine brownouts and blackouts, and that's not good for um, survivability either. So, and, and I heard that's predicted for Oregon with within the next year and a half or so that they're, they're, they're thinking there could be brownouts there as well because of hydropower and the amount. And if you keep limiting other types of power, my house is heated on propane um, where we are. And, you know, you start limiting this and, and much of the country coal fire power plants is what fires up the energy. You, you know, I, I understand all of this is not the super clean, but then it seems what, what I find hypocritical about it, is we don't want coal, we don't want natural gas, we don't want propane, we don't want electricity or hydro dams, but we want the power. And we, we also will not allow you to have the cleaner source, which is nuclear power. Correct. So what, where is this with the council? Here's the part that kind of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I understand is you made a motion, I, I think it was you, and this was to take this to a vote of the people and the council said no. That's correct. Uh, I made a motion on, I believe it was February 6th, uh, to, I'm currently council president, which is a rotating position among counselors, seated counselors. And I made a motion to refer this to a public vote. And uh, that failed in a 3-5 vote, meaning three counselors voted in favor of it, five voted against. And then uh, a counselor um, made a surprise motion to 
go ahead and uh, put forth to a vote uh, the, the, the full ban, which wasn't even to be discovered until later this month. And that passed 5-3. So, so wait, wait, we are. what's that? So what's that? Explain that, that one more time. I, I didn't quite. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, another counselor, we were there to discuss referring this to the public. And that uh, was, was this brought little forward. band, the band just on new single level. Ridden. New low level, low rise construction, sing, uh, residential construction. And that motion Fair. I made to refer it to the public for a vote because it's, it's, I think it's a big enough issue. It should go to the public and that vote, it was voted down after that, a second motion that nobody was expecting was made um, by one of the supporting, one of the counselors who supports the ban. Yes, to go ahead and just pass the ban, which wasn't to be discussed what, till what later. Ban? The entire, like every. The, 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 no, the low rise residential just went ahead to and propose that, and that passed 5 3. So a second motion was made that wasn't expected to go ahead and just put the ban to a vote, and it passed. So now you guys have this, uh, they have to gather enough signatures or the council's doing this on its own? Well, the council did that on its own, but there is a group of um, community members that's called, I believe it's uh, Concerned Citizens for Energy Choice. And I'm not directly connected to that group, but they are out collecting signatures. Um, the proponents of the ban are, are claiming that Northwest Natural, has, uh, uh, which is the gas company, has contributed, right. you know, thousands of dollars to the effort. Uh, I have, I don't know. I haven't looked at the the filings or any of that. But anyway, I understand. And again, I don't have direct knowledge, but I understand that they've already kept, collected more than double the signatures they need to get it on a ballot. Now, explain to my viewer why. So there, it's already the council already wants to put the issue on the ballot. No, the council does not want to put the issue on the ballot. The council voted against the motion to put it on the ballot and then went ahead and passed the ban. Oh, okay. I'm the, now I'm catching up with you. Okay. I, I apologize. Okay. I don't know how to no. say it any no, Randy, you're, You probably said it fine. He said, but that's what this is about. It's about discussing this stuff so we yes. get it. So yes. what, what concerns me in all of this, one of the things that concerns me is the, the council works for the people of Eugene what are they afraid of, of this going to a vote if, um, which also I understand, well, well t talk to me about that. What, why wouldn't you as a representative of the people want to go ahead and say, okay, fine, let's let the people of Eugene decide? Rick, that's a very good question. And I think it's one for my colleagues that voted against referring this to a vote. I, to me, it makes sense. I think uh, we are a representative form of government. We're a democratic republic. And I think council needs to be the ones that make the decisions on the, the business of running the city. But when it gets into money measures, uh, when it gets into decisions that remove uh, choice and severely limit one's ability to function or operate, I think that belongs in the hands of the public and we are here to serve we the people and as far as democracy and taking a critical issue like this to a public vote that's why I made the motion and that's why I supported taking it to a vote. Yeah because what that says to me is you're afraid that I mean you're it, it's kind of in my opinion and I'm not asking you to comment but in my opinion it's arrogant because you're you're assuming we know better than you we're not, you know I we don't think this is going to pass so we're going to just push it through because this is really what's best for everybody when that's not how the government works it's not how it's supposed to work it should be and and obviously they hit a nerve with people because you know to get double the number I remember the first week they needed like 6,500, let's just say close to that, somehow around 6,000, some, some. 6,460 uh, to be exact. And they got 7,400 in a week. That was one week. So obviously this hit a nerve in the business community and they can blame it on Northwest Natural Gas. I'm sure if I was Northwest Natural Gas, I would be putting some money in this to try to, to save my business. Um, but obviously there's a nerve there with people saying, you, you know, one, you, you, we need energy sources and two, you don't get to tell us what to do. I mean, you have a housing shortage. Any, how, how does this help the affordable housing situation in Eugene, Oregon? 
my fear, and I'll, I'll couch it in these terms, my fear is it's just going to drive more construction outside the Eugene city limits, our 43 square miles that are Eugene. And, and is it, I understand the chambers come out against this, and, but I also understand, which I think is, well, I know Vani and the chamber in Springfield. The Springfield chamber, I think, has also come out against this. So what did, what, it, some people might think, well, hey, you know, all that business is going to, just going to go over to Springfield if they don't have the van. What, what is Springfield afraid of, do you think? Well, I think we're, there's some of us that are seeing our area as a region. And okay. that's what I think, that's how I think we should be looking at it. The economy does not stop at I-5, which is the dividing line between the two cities. The economy moves back and forth. And quite frankly, what is good for Springfield, I believe is good for Eugene. Mm -hmm. And what is good for Eugene is good for Springfield. That was behind our merger effort when we merged the two fire departments. We wanted to get politics out of it. And let's just look at response capability, response times, and providing the most cost-effective service we could for the community. And I think that's how we should be looking at everything we do. We can still be individual communities, but we should be able to join hands when we can, especially on economic development. Randy, when you, when you hear something like this too, does it, you know, I mean, it, Oregon already kind of outside of the borders of the state, at least the Willamette Valley, has this reputation of, of um, you know, a, what I hear is, you know, people here say, did, they, they'll pull you aside and say, did you guys really pass a bill that allows for hard drugs? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and then they, 110. 110. And then they, they want to know, well, no wonder you guys have such a big problem with homelessness because that's pretty attractive to transient, not, not regular homeless, homeless people. I'm talking about people that are coming into the state because they can get anything they need. Um, Free medical, free health care, you know, drugs, they'll pay a hundred dollar fine and you're, you're, you're out of jail. Um, you're, are you afraid that you're becoming a mecca for um, a, a kind of economic development that may not be the most productive in your community? I'm afraid we've become that. And what I think we need to work on is reversing that trend. Uh, yeah, it's one of the reasons I ran for office. I, I was concerned with some of the directions we were headed. Uh, I took great pride in serving my community for um, almost 37 years as a firefighter and ultimately fire chief. And I took my responsibility to serve and protect the community very seriously. And I started after retirement, I was, was actually enjoying retirement. I started watching um, the trends, how things were going. And um, when my counselor, who is a friend of personal friend of mine and backed me in running for uh, the position, I've been in the, the seat for just over two years. I did that because I wanted to try and help make a difference. I felt like I had a lot of civic experience. Um, of course, I make sense to myself, but, uh, you know, we all do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But, you know, one of the things I want to add this, one of the things I've noticed since I took office is we spend a lot of time talking at each other and not talking with each other. And I tell it, explain to people the difference as you see well, it. Well, talking at we're just is just a matter of throwing your perspective and your opinion in somebody else's face without really listening to how they think about an issue. And I believe our best work is done when we can find ways to come together as a community. And let's start with what we can agree on and start working with that as we work our way out. Take, take the energy piece, take climate protection. You know, what are the points we can agree on? That's why I brought up weatherization, because I right. think everybody wants to use less energy. And quite frankly, that's one of our ways out of whether you believe in it or not, our current situation is to reduce our energy dependence, regardless of energy type. Right. That's smart. And it, I, I think sometimes, too, like what, what I noticed is one of the things that that happens in in a place like Eugene and Springfield both is that we get um, that it become I think for so many years people throw up their hands and just go oh whatever you know and you just can't do that you have to I know four people who are running on the Eugene school board because what people don't understand is school boards city councilors planning commissions all those kind of things that's where you have the real power where you go in and you say. You know, no, you don't have to do things my way, but I want my voice included in this conversation. And to me, I can say this. It's so obvious 
that you have five members on your council who really don't aren't, aren't open to listening to a bunch of people. You do not have to quote on that, but or say anything on that. But if you're not going to let the people decide on something, you, you may want to get a different career and you may need to get people in there who are saying, you know what? I'm a progressive, but I think everybody should have a voice and everybody should be listened to. And I don't think I'm right all the time and that we need to come up with a solution that maybe it's energy efficiency and then something else that comes up, you know, that you can work on too. But, the, but, but to put things on the table that the community obviously is, sounds like they don't want, I guess you'll find out when you have a vote. Um, but then you got to get people out to vote too. That's the other piece of it. People need to care enough to vote. People need to care enough to stand up and be heard. And, you know, I've, I've always had the opinion, Rick, that everyone's voice matters or yeah. nobody's voice matters. And I agree. that's, that's how we need to go forward. We need to find the things that pull us together and not divide us. And when we take actions that are divisive in this community, it works counter to what we should be doing as leaders in the community. So to, to end this thing on a really positive note, tell me, <laughs> tell me what, um, what do you love about Eugene? But I mean, you've, you've committed to doing this, you've retired there. Um, now you're serving the community. And um, what do you love about that town? I've always liked Eugene's unique favor, or flavor. And we've, we've always been a little bit weird. I mean, that's just the way, that's the way it is. But it, to me, it's, it's enchanting. And it's, it's part of, of, of who we are. But, you know, beyond that, I, I love being in a university city, town. I love the natural elements in our community with the Willamette River and the McKinsey close by. Um, I, I, I love the mountains being an hour away. I like the coast being right at an hour the other direction. I mean, there's just so much to enjoy about the community we have. And I think we have very caring people. It's, it's just a matter, and the pandemic was no friend no. Uh, to any of our communities. It, 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 things have just kind of shifted and changed. And my hope, my prayers are to bring us back together. I mean, not me, that we find our path back together. And again, work towards what do we have in common rather than what is dissimilar. Right. As, as communities, you know, I think that's what I've noticed here. That's so interesting. in you know, town of 1700 where I live Townsend, um, everybody needs each other. So yeah, sure. People disagree, but when it comes down to it and Bill has cancer and he's not doing well, everybody's out raising money, having a fundraiser, doing something to make sure that his family is taken care of. And, and Eugene is like that in pockets. And I, I go back when I first moved there, like 30 some years ago, and they had the Eugene celebration down there and there was hippies and, and conservatives and liberals and progressives and everybody, no, everybody kind of got along in their own way. And, and I think um, we need to get back to those times where, you know, you really are listening to one another and it, and, and it's going to be hard, I think, because I think the pandemic really, you know, for me, it really exposed some, some hard truths about the world we live in. And, and I, but I, 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 I don't know, do you see, I kind of see this all of a sudden this resurgence of people going, huh, -uh. I'm, I'm going to, I'll talk to you and I'll listen to you, but I'm going to, I'm going to offer my opinion and you can't shut me down anymore. And I think that's healthy for everybody. I am starting to see some of that, but we, we need, we need more of that. We need people telling us what they expect. We are here to serve our communities. I'll say that again. As elected officials, we are here to serve our communities. And when we stop listening or listen to only a small swath or even half, I think we, we stop being effective. I mean, we need to listen. Like I said, everybody's voice counts or nobody's voice counts. Now, at the end of the day, you still have to make decisions, but it shouldn't be without truly listening and understanding the different perspectives. Right. And, and not villainizing people who think differently than you. Um, you know, and I, I think that is an interesting twist is it's almost like the public servants have somehow um, and I think the public has given up its responsibility to be the boss. I mean, the people of Eugene actually are Randy Grove's bosses and yeah. you do what they tell you to do. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, yes. And I think somehow over the last 20, 30, 40 years, it's, it's changed even, you know, the legislature, the national scene as well, as all of a sudden it's become, 
they're the people in charge. And it's like, no, nah, I always try to impress on people. You, they work for you. And the sooner we learn that, and that's why I'm excited to see that many people putting out a petition in Eugene, Oregon, to say at least, I want my voice heard. That's what I hear them saying is I, I and maybe when you push too hard, this is what you get. Well, I, I think this is going to be a good study in uh, our community and what really matters. And I, I, I hope that all of my colleagues are watching this process like I am. You know, the, the reality is we are from the community as city councilors. I mean, right. we're the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker. I mean, that's that is the reality of things. It doesn't mean uh, I know any more about energy than the next person. You know, we all bring certain um, amount of expertise. I mean, I understand emergency response, the fire service, uh, resiliency and mitigation, but I'm certainly not an expert on some of the other areas where we need to make informed decisions. And that's incumbent upon us to work extra hard to make sure we have the right and relevant facts. When you look at the country as a whole, um, where do you think we're headed? Well, I think there's going to be a point of reckoning and maybe we've already reached it, maybe not. But I think we need to get back. I think government needs to get back to, again, focus, focusing on we the people. I mean, it is exactly what you were saying. We, we, need, to be, we need to be taking that seriously. And if we're not, then, you know, put somebody else in office. Don't you think it's kind of, um, in a way, it's kind of exciting to see? Well, it, it is, but it's what the part I don't like about it. There's people out there being hurt. There's yeah. people out there who are scared and terrified. I've listened to I don't know how many young people that are afraid our planet is dying. Yeah. And I mean, it's real fear. This is this is not a stage show. And that always concerns me. You know, I, I work, have, having worked my whole adult life in emergency services, you know, part of what we do is provide a level of confidence and a sense of security and safety to the public. It goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of social need. And you were talking about, you know, poor people in other countries that are just trying to survive every day. They're on those lowest, most yeah. basic rungs of that pyramid, that hierarchy. You know, we're worried about things that are much higher, higher up. And yet it's, um, we have these, these very strenuous debates that really, turn into people again talking to at each other and not with each other since you come from you know fire background medical services emergency response how how um how dangerous is fear oh fear can make you do unbelievably um stupid things sometimes i mean that you know a person that wasn't in that state wouldn't react the way they did in fact during um during my time in, in the department, we even transitioned the way emergency services people operate. We switched from more of a reactive mode, which is using, you know, basically the, the lizard part of your brain to a response mode for when emergencies happen within the emergency. You know, things always change in emergency operations. There's always the unforeseen. You'll have a partial collapse. You'll have just things happen. <clears throat> and this adaptive thinking model that we moved to trained our incident commanders, and they don't even use that terminology in fire anymore because it's just ingrained, but it, it teaches you to respond in a thinking responsive mode, which is the frontal lobes, rather than a reactive mode, which is the brainstem, and it produces better products, and so when we are, when people are scared, they are, they're doing things they normally wouldn't do. It, it causes people to react in ways they wouldn't react. And I think that's some of what we're seeing right now in society. I yeah. think people are scared on a lot of fronts. That is, yeah, because, I mean, with the economy, inflation, yeah. people's retirements, I mean, there's a lot to be afraid of. But I love what you're saying, because if we go up with just the, that back part of our brain and just react, it's, it's never going to be real good. If we sit no. and think through it and go, okay, let's look at the reality here. And then if we are thinking from here, aren't we more apt to have a better, com be more apt to do what you're saying is start listening to people. Because if I'm back here, I ain't hearing nothing except right. for what my brain's telling me and I'm right and the world is going to fall apart and everybody, my, my 401k is going to go away. Up here, it says, look at history. 
Um, how, how much has the climate changed over history? How much has inflation changed over history? How much has, my, has pe the stock market gone up and down and up and down? These are cyclical things that happen. So I need to call myself and say, does that mean there's still a problem? Yes. Does that mean I still need to do something about the environment to protect it? Yes, I should. But I don't need to react from back here because despite what you know, our vice president says, and I'm not getting you into this, I'm just saying this. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, we're, we're not going to, we're still here. And as I saw all the predictions, we were going to be gone by now. So it doesn't mean it's not real. And that's the other thing we need to stop doing is when someone brings up something that's counter to my way of thinking, stop belittling it, stop censoring it. Because what we can already see coming out after the, the, the pandemic is by censoring information, we could have caused more problems than we would have if we were to let all this alternative information come out and let people digest it and come up with their own answers. And now we're starting to see the day of reckoning and it doesn't look pretty. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think you're right on a number, of, a number of fronts and it applies to a lot of the things we're looking at. And you're absolutely right about timelines. Timelines, we, we are compressing them I think more than they need to be compressed. Right. You know, this, this is this, this, where we are right now as a society in our point in history necessitates, it requires a thoughtful planned response, not a reaction. Yeah. I, Randy, God, I just learned so much <laughs> from you. No, I mean, but don't you, I love how life is like that. So you take an emergency response program and really, I should be, this is what happened to me right when the pandemic came. Right prior to that, I had a business coach and we were going through, okay, Rick, this is what fear does to your business. And if you're fearful that this is going to go under or this isn't going to work or blah, you need to get, so I'm practicing all this, then that hits. And I'm like, well, everybody's panicking and I can't, I'm, I've just learned I can't. And so I need to take this. So it really helped get me through, but it also caused a lot of problems because then I started questioning things going, wait a minute. But I think there's some real value in all of us, even when you're in a conversation thinking, where's this coming from, here or here? And if it's back here, we as human beings can push it to the front. We, we have the ability to push the conversation back up here. It starts by what you're talking about, listening to people. That I bet listening, Randy, is what brings the stops the panic, brings it forward and that relaxing, those breaths, that kind of thing, so that you can then have an intelligent conversation. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I'll share one other thing from my emergency response days. I could always tell how serious an incident was by the tone and cadence of the responders talking on the radio. The more calm, the more modulated they were, the more precise they were in their communications, the worst it was, the worst oh. it was. And that's because they are falling into that frontal lobe and controlling. And, and I used to say when I would teach people is talk at a level where you think you're talking in slow motion. I guarantee you with the adrenaline and everything else going on, you're talking at the perfect speed and cadence. So do you think it's, it's an education thing with a, like, it's a practice? Like if we learn when we get into a hairy situation or somebody comes up and challenges us um, to, it, to take that deep breath, slow down our speech, bring the conversation to the front. And maybe that means talking less, listening more. And we can actually train because you obviously train men and women to do this. Like, uh, so it became natural for them. Could you imagine Randy, if we as city leaders and community leaders and stuff like that could learn how to do that, um, not be fearful and just go in and let's just have that could be the key to getting communication back to the a point where we can all have a, a voice in that in that uh, particular thing. I agree. I always uh, advocate for start with listening. And I always try to remind at least my people back in the fire department that half of the communication process is listening. Yeah. And we aren't as a society very good at that. We're terrible and, at it. And when I say <laughs> when I say we, I mean me too. You know, me too. You know what's funny, Randy, is the other day I, I made a. Um, it was a real learning experience for me. I made a. Um, I posted something that I I checked two sources and I thought it was good. It, it looked it looked valid and um, and it was something about Disney changing 
a policy or something. And I put it out there. People started challenging me going, I can't find that anywhere. So I thought, oh, God. So I went in and started digging a little more. And I found on a page, it said, this was a satire. It was meant to be satirical. And so I went, oh, shit. So I thought, I went back to my old KZI days. What would I do? Well, I'd have to go on the air and apologize. So I put together a little video, apologize, say, I am, I'm really sorry. I messed up. And I checked sources. I thought it was real. I got caught. But um, I'm out here telling, you know, so I'm just doing this apology. That video had more views than anything I've done in about a year and a half. And people who, who just coming on going, God, thank you for just admitting it and telling us. I mean, I, and I, it kind of, it, it, it warmed my heart, but it also kind of to told me, you know what people are looking for? Real, like real conversations, real apologies, real, I don't know all the answers, you know, real, like, I, let's get your input, City of Eugene, on this issue. And let, let's not be afraid of a vote, because if we lose, that means it wasn't supposed to happen. That's okay. And, and I think if people would start I, I, in my own life, that's what I'm trying to do now is go, just be real, be purposeful. I'm still going to go after things, but you're going to push in and, and listen more. And I think there's a, I don't know. I, it was, it was profound for me. I mean, cause it, I, it is, I've been in that spot too. And I, I was, and I'm sorry, I cut you off. There. No, no, you're fine. Yeah. You know, part, part of leadership is being able to admit when you're wrong, it's being authentic. It's being honest and we can't be expected to know everything and get everything right first time every time the reality is we're all human we always make mistakes what i'm hoping for is we can get to a point where there's more trust more honesty and more grace you know it would be really interesting I, I totally agree with you i i think what would be really you know you, you could change this situation the conversation in Eugene, Oregon could turn around. And this is my, this is not Randy. This is me. But if the five members who ended up pushing this uh, band through um, saw how many signatures were on this ballot petition, if you went back to the people of Eugene and said, you know what? Um, we may have made a mistake. We, we really care about the climate. We really care about the environment, but it's clear that we're moving too quickly and the people of Eugene aren't ready for this. And um, so you're voting to put this on and, and we're just, let's just see how this works out. You, you, that could be the beginning of a new conversation, a turnaround with the city of Eugene. And I think that would spread like wildfire uh, to other places because, um, you know, I mean, those are, those are facts. It's like you, you push something through and now people are really responding. And if you want, if you care about the people in your community, what a great way to say, hey, we're going to back up a little bit, but, but you have to kind of put your ego in a little bag and you got to put your wills and everything else, the things that you think are important in a little bag and say, you know, what's the most important is that we start talking again. Cause if we can start talking climate change that we could, we can fix this. We can find some solutions. If we can start talking about things and going, yeah, that's a great idea. That's where you need to be. And you don't, don't agree with I me hope. or disagree. I don't want to, I don't want to get you in trouble. That's just a great, I think, as we're talking, I'm just thinking that would be such a cool thing. Um, and from my experience, just, you know, and, and I wasn't doing the apology to get fanfare. I was embarrassed. <laughs> and I put, I mean, I laid in bed all night and went, oh, shit, how can I get around this? How can I, how can I just take it off or I could do this or I could do this? And I just thought, you know, I'm just going to do an apology because that's what I just bitched about the day before about how the, the media is saying nothing about all these other th answers to these ideas about Wuhan lab and COVID and all that. They're saying nothing about, Hey, we're sorry. We uh, you know, held back the information or censored people. Uh, we should have let everybody do it. And then I, then I make a mistake. Well, <laughs> you know? Again, Rick, we're, we're human. Right. We're going to make mistakes. I'm sure that's not your last mistake in life. No. I, I, I've got, unfortunately, <clears throat> many more in front of me. What's important is how we handle our mistakes and, what you did there was show leadership by being able to say, Hey, I got it wrong. And I'm correcting that. And first it's admitting. And that's the hardest part. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Once you, you know, I have a lot to be humble about. And once you figure that out in life, I think admitting error is just 
chopping wood. Yes. Somebody said to me that they, you seem so much more relaxed. Like you just, whatever. I said, you know, when you get past 60, you just, there's so much you don't care about, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's so much you do care about, but it's, it's much more honed in and funneled into this, you know, one level. And for me, like you, it's, it's about everybody has should have a voice and, the, and it, whether I agree with it or not, you should be able to have your conversation. Now I'm going to be very vocal about mine as well, but everybody should have that part of the conversation. Absolutely. Randy Groves, that was the most, that was fun. Well, I, I enjoyed it too. But I, I also want to say for the viewers that don't know you as a former reporter and KEZI anchor, I always thought you did a fantastic job. And uh, you know, the, the one time I was on the water cooler, with you it was it was less than comfortable uh not by your fault but uh just the circumstances and uh but you you've always uh handled it with class and well, dignity that. and diplomacy and I, I do appreciate that and so thank you for all you've done over the years no i appreciate that and i get you know i get some i get hit pretty hard now that i'm out here in the social media world but that's the place we play you know and if you're out here in this in this garden you're gonna there's gonna be dirt clods and stuff thrown at you but i do see a lot more people willing to have the conversation and i i when i said earlier i was excited about where we are i think we're i don't think we've hit rock bottom yet but i think we're getting down to this place where people are starting to come back and go you know maybe we should start listening to that and and i'm hoping but i'm, I'm kind of this you know weird optimist that i i do think once the people understand i, I think the biggest thing that has destroyed uh parts of oregon for me is is like the rest of the country is apathy um, you know, yeah. we, we allowed, we just allowed you people in government, you know, Oh, just, we voted them in, they better do the right thing. And then no, you know, you go to a city council meeting and the, the, you know, all the people who, who are on one side of the fence, they don't show up. And so then they wonder why things always happen because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So what that tells me is we need more squeaky grease wheels on all sides of issues to be able to go to, to Go to bat for this stuff. If you don't stand up, don't expect anybody to do it for you because they won't. That's part of the process. Yeah. Randy Gross, city councilor in Eugene. Um, good luck with your natural gas thing. I hope it doesn't explode on you. And I do hope that something happens um, that, that maybe people will start to listen again. And I, I, I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting that Eugene is getting on board and saying enough is enough. Um, sometime I'd like to have you on and talk about your homeless situation. Cause I think we could learn a lot, um, in other places of what not to do and what to do. That's been my number one issue I've worked on since taking office. Uh, I, my, my council ward is West Southwest Eugene, where we were hit, um, very hard with an out of control, unhoused, um, problem, crime problem, uh, just a number of things. And, and we actually, West Eugene, if you drive through it today, it looks markedly different than it wow. looked 18 months, two years ago. And it, it wasn't easy, but I do think we have found things that work that um, I like to lead with compassion, but I believe in following up with a hard bottom line and, and holding people accountable and responsible for their actions and behaviors. And I think finding that balance is part of the key to success. I'm going to guess that a lot of that happened too, by businesses getting involved and in getting, oh, absolutely. getting standing up and saying, you know what, if we're going to, cause I saw that before I left is businesses were starting to go, I can't put up with this anymore. Um, the, they were leaving. The, yeah. The vandals. They couldn't, they the couldn't get their They couldn't get their semis in and out of their uh, loading docks and loading yards because the streets were strewn with campers and RVs. Um, I'm not saying it's a hundred percent taken care of, but it is markedly better than it was to before. And I the have key is getting people. The key I is have getting... before and after pictures. Oh, really? I, I did. Well, yeah, I've got a whole, I've, I've spoken to community groups uh, about this and I, I have my whole PowerPoint that I've updated as we've gone. And you can see before and after shots that uh, show you what it was like and what it is now. And, and like I said, we've, we've led with compassion. We've created hundreds of sites where people can go and they are managed so you don't have right. some of the problems you have with an unregulated site and we, we've we've changed our parking ordinance three times but i'll save that for another day but okay. I, think, I think there are some good good things to to talk about challenges but also good things all right 
Randy Groves, thank you for making the time to join us. And I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for the invite. And to uh, the viewers, uh, thank you for watching. I, I appreciate that as well. And I, I, I hope I've been able to at least help explain the situation. All right, Randy Groves, thank you. Thank you. So that's how a conversation should go. Uh, a couple things I think to learn from that. Um, just let people talk. Like Randy and I didn't have to be all focused on everything. It, just, it turns into a conversation that we can all learn from. Um, the other thing is, I, I think there's something big between that fear. We have to fight fear. And I know people will write me and say, oh, but fear is that. No, if you're trying to have make decisions and you're fearful, you're not going to make good decisions. So we've got to start as community members, as people in this country, is start thinking from here not reacting from back here. Take this, share it on your page, let other people see it. Uh, really appreciate your support. Tomorrow night, uh, small rural Oregon town, <clears throat> city council's going in a direction a lot of people didn't want them to. So they got a bunch of people and voted them out. <laughs> That's what you do. And we're going to talk to them about how that worked, what happened and why. All right. I'm Rick Dancer. This is Get Real with Rick Dancer. I'll talk to you tomorrow.